Welcome to the Light Forge. This is Adwukta. This is Murps. I am back. It feels like it's been forever, but it's only been two weeks. And I'm guessing the reason it's felt like forever is because a lot of stuff has happened in the two weeks that we have been gone. Also, and, you oh, were in yeah. Arkansas for like a large oh, yeah. number of days. I feel like time True. probably just moves slower in Arkansas. <laughs> Also, I've spent a lot of time playing Pokemon Go, so uh, it, it's just, I've done a lot of walking. Way too much cardio than I would like to have done. Like, this is what I hear as soon as I get on the uh, the, the Hangouts call with Murps. He's like, yo, hey, I've, been, I've been making real-life friends with Pokemon Go this weekend. You don't even understand. I'm like, I, I do not know that Murps has made a real-life friend in, like, this year. In 2017, these may have been the first real-life friends Murps has made. I don't try, because... Okay, we can, we can leave that for, like, a separate question from the GOAT of why <laughs> I do not like making friends. Man, that just sounds so bad, doesn't it? Uh -huh. Can we rephrase it in another way? No, just real-life friends. You're good with the online friends. You accept your Battle.net request friends or whatever, you know? Right. Well, let's just say that I try to keep a very limited list, okay. right? Not on Bnet, in real life. Mm -hmm. You actually try to keep a short list on Bnet. Um, and in real life. And in real life, mm -hmm. that is true. Anyways, that's not what we want to talk about. There's so week. much to talk about this week. There's so, so much. much. Oh my god. And also, this is uh, episode 101, right? Yep, episode 101. Which, uh, you know, it looks like Lightforge 101, like a college class, right? Like the intro class that tells you what it's about. So this Lightforge is going to be set up with pretty much everything we try to do in the Lightforge. Between, like, telling you stuff about the arena, to telling you arena news, to talking about the leaderboard, which is the only competitive aspect of arena that exists now and uh we don't have a guest today but we'll try to have one next week or the week after sounds good all right so out of to we've had two weeks of stuff happen what's the biggest thing the biggest news is that kft is out or is going to come out i'm gonna call it kft i don't know if anyone else is calling it kft but it is the knights of the frozen throne is the next expansion people thought it was gonna have something to do with dollar run but no it was about some other magic that was darker but still blue it's gonna be all about shatter man it's gonna be the shatter meta everything's gonna be frozen uh, it's actually gonna be the uh the heroes <laughs> becoming undead meta uh as we've uh, as we found out so uh, this is the biggest exciting news that's come out and they hyped it up a bunch they had the announcement of the announcement of the announcement they had the announcement of the announcement then they had the announcement itself and when the announcement came out we were all hyped up and it was like since Nax, I have never been more disappointed in the announcement that Blizzard has made uh, about her stone. That they actually the impacts the, arena. the purple hoodie. Huh? They had the awkward guy in the purple hoodie. Yes, they had a guy like cosplay someone, like like a Death Knight, I think. I don't know, or like I Kel, Kel, whatever, Arthias, Ar 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 Whatever oh, the God. guy is, the, the dude, the main Death Knight dude. Yeah, yeah, you nailed it. You yeah? nailed yeah, it. Did I nail that pronunciation? Yeah. All right, good. Yeah. So uh, Arathas, or whatever the guy's name is, is the uh, original, like, Death Knight person. Um, and they tried to cosplay him, I think, and it did not turn out very well. Yeah. Turned out just about as well as your pronunciation. Mm -hmm. Anyways, new expansion is on the horizon, uh, which is always exciting. And as you guys know, I I've been kind of tired a little bit jaded uh for this current meta and it's just cyclical right you just uh we we were sort of in the doldrums and uh nothing like expansion news to sort of pick us up a little bit um so this is the first news and we will be hearing further news uh at the end of the month so this is sort of the teaser right to just get us going but uh, Adam, so what are we going to see from this expansion? All right, well, um, we're obviously, obviously going to see uh, Arathas um, sometime, probably as a boss. But, so the really exciting part from just like a normal Hearthstone player's perspective is that they're giving you essentially like half an expansion for free. There's going to be like two wings to this expansion, and it's like adventure style, and you're just going to like get it. Um, and that's, that's cool. Uh, but in terms of the actual cards, uh, the main mechanic that's going to come out has to do with legendaries which means it's probably not gonna have that much effect on arena but they may there's also some rumblings that they may change the arena offering rates to these legendaries to make them actually appear semi-frequently in arena so don't write these cards off yet this is the opposite of quests right when quest came out uh, uh, blizzard was immediately like these are not going to be in the arena and that was a good idea because if they were in the arena they would be the worst cards ever because they're all heavily synergy based but these are very different. These hero cards are the new legendary cards. They're a new card type. And you can think of them as Jiraxis. They do the same thing as Jiraxis, except they're not classified as a minion at all with a battle cry. It's just a card with a battle cry. They still call it a battle cry. I don't know why. 
Um, right. And uh, the battle cry effects, you know, activates whenever you play the card, and the card replaces your hero, and you get five armor. I think it's five armor across the board, no matter which Death Knight you equip, and it changes your hero power into something else. So that's the whole thing. Um, I don't know if they're all going to be the same mana or different manas, but they're all going to have different hero powers. And Blizzard has said that they're going to make your hero power do something your class would normally not do. So they showed the Hunter one. Hunter's very aggressive normally, deal 2 damage to opponent's face. The battle cry here is deal 2 damage to all enemy minions. So it's a control style board clear. And on top of that, the new hero power lets you create like zombie beasts or whatever that are like like a more fancy version of what... Um, of what um, Jaraxxus does, right? Which is make a 6-6 on the board. But generally the right. same thing. You're getting a super overvalued minion. Uh, and what happens... Uh, so, uh, it was revealed on Trump's stream exactly how the hunter hero power works. Uh, you basically get to combine two beasts, ranging from one mana to five mana. And you get to combine them. So, uh, for example, if you combine... And it's discover is, style, right? You get to, like, pick. Right. Uh, and, and you get to combine two minions uh, together. So you can combine, for example, like a Vicious Fledgling and a Stone Tusk Boar, right? So now you have a 4-mana four 4-4 four, four that charges to the face and adapts, which is pretty scary. That seems kind of <laughs> that, OP. That seems kind of OP. But, you know, once again, you have to get that combination. Uh, or you can do Strangle Thorn Tiger plus Vicious Fledgling, and you have an 8-mana eight 8-8 eight eight stealth that adapts. Okay. And they, do they do they go on the board or do they go in your hand? They go in your hand, right? Or else they're, the mana cost. Yeah. No, okay. They go on, so they go, go on. They go, go in your hand, which makes the um, you know, which makes it not the same as Jaraxxus. I got that wrong. I thought they were on the board. I was like a little unclear about it. Uh, but yeah, so they go into your hand. So it's a card draw mechanic. Yeah, it definitely pushed. Look, Blizzard has uh, basically since GBG uh, tried to push mid range or control hunter. Control right? hunter. And sometimes, look, Hunter always finds a way to be aggressive, uh, even with, you know, their attempts at lock and load, stampede, etc. They, they either succeed in being aggressive or they just get wiped out from the meta. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and this is just the way, way it has been. Uh, but it has been revealed, right, that these al altern like alternate hero cards, I guess we'll call them that, um, will be available in the arena. Uh, and that's pretty cool, right? Because we've had a lot of toys not available to us in yep. the arena. Um, and, and keep in mind, it's not going to be that hard. Like, because there's still these cards that allow you to discover cards from other, like, from all the classes, and they give a bonus to class cards. You know, like your, um, I guess for Hunter, it's the Grime Street Outfitter. Oh, sorry, Grime Street Scout Lookout. Whichever the what? two mana 1-1 one, one is, lets you discover a card from all three classes. Um, informant. Informant, yeah. The Grime Street Informant. So we're going to get a Grime Street Informant that you can get this out of. And on top of that, it's not that rare in the first place. Like, think about Pyros. Think about how often you see Pyros just, like, in the arena randomly, right? Like, it's the same thing. This, these cards, even without an extra offering bonus, are going to be available. And on top of that, they may just classify these cards, at the very least, the same as spells and weapons, right? That's, like, a very easy thing Blizzard can do. Because they're not minions, Right, and all non-minion cards right now get that bonus, get that spell bonus. Um, now yeah, that weapons yeah. are included, so they could just include these cards in that pool, and it'll instantly be like doubly seen as pyros, which is already not terribly rare in the arena. Like, yeah, you go, oh, pyros, whenever you see him, but generally you're not like, oh my god, how could he freaking have like you know had a pyros? You're like, this happens. So these right. cards will just happen, and quite frequently, right? It may happen at double pyros rate. The, uh, well, because of the changes that they've made in the uh, past few months, you never say that about any card anymore. You're never <laughs> totally shocked, right? Every single card in the arena, when you see it, you're like, okay, that was unfortunate, but reasonable. Yep. And, you know, like, if you listened to the Life Forge like, a year ago, we were, like, very dismissive about Legendaries, right? We wouldn't even review Legendaries. we just give it a score on the tier list when it came out, and then you guys will ask some questions and we'll answer them. Because you never see them in the arena. Then when the offering odds changed, we started focusing on Legendaries, because they're, like, reasonably seen in the arena at, like, a, quite a decent rate. And so these right. cards, with the... Remember, you're going to get the bonus, probably, of the spell bonus. You're definitely going to get the bonus of the class card, and you're definitely going to get the set bonus, which is double. And so you're going to see these cards quite frequently. And so we're going to review these cards and they are going to impact the arena. 
Yeah, sounds good. So our, our, is is that what we're doing? Like, are we literally doing that right now? Control Hunter? Control Hunter. Control Hunter. Um, that's that's what's happening right now. Control Hunter is going to be a thing in the, uh, in the next expansion, and uh, it's going to be interesting. Um, in terms of a draft, that really makes... Like, you can use these cards flexibly too, right? Like, you can just put this in an aggro deck, and worst comes to worst, all this means is at the point at which you will fail aggro, you now have a control out, right? Because you can always put, like, five mana cards together. And then you can get, like, essentially uh, use up all of your mana and get an extra card draw every single turn. On top of just having had a board clear and getting some extra health. So yep. it is one card that gives you an entire control out, even if you have an otherwise very aggro hunter. So you can do that. Or if you had a control hunter, you could just make the control hunter, like, 80 times better. Right? Or, like, a yeah, hunter definitely. or something. This is a card that provides you with actual infinite value, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot, just, it, it is one of the true infinite value generators in the game, right? Uh, at the level um, of, you know, like a Ysera, uh, where it's it's not just, like, with some Inspire cards, yes, you can get, quote, infinite value, but you're You'll getting, eventually, like, like with. Right, right. Uh, you'll eventually whiff, or the infinite value that you get is like an extra plus one, plus one every turn, which is yeah. meh. Yeah. So yeah, so we spent like a lot of time talking about this card, and like I said, right, legendaries are in the arena now, and all indications are that this card is going to, at the very least, get a higher offering bonus than other like class legendary cards, it, even if it's just considered a spell. Um, okay. So along those lines, we have another uh, hero. I'm just going to go over all these cards because Blizzard also announced, by the way, this is their new announcement policy, that they're not going to make any more announcements about the new expansion, like any more card reveals until the 24th. So we're just going to go over the five cards they gave us now and like then we'll, we'll put this expansion off to the side and come back to it when they tell us more info. <laughs> Yep. Um, so yeah, so another uh, legendary hero, that Death Knight that can replace your... Uh, sorry, uh, another card, uh, another legendary card. This one's just a regular minion, my bad. It's Prince Keleseth, and it's a 2-mana two 2-2. Two -two. Battlecry, if your deck has no 2-cost cards, give all minions in your deck plus 1, plus 1. Um, which is pretty insane of a buff. Uh, keep in mind, it doesn't affect minions in your hand, just the ones in your deck still. Um, and your deck can't have two cost cards, so your other two cost cards could be in your hand. So we know that in Arena now, it's like technically viable not to have any two drops. If you're control enough, if you have enough board clears, if you have enough taunts. So it's still a viable card in the Arena. Um, and Arena games go on for pretty long, so you're going to get some value out of this uh, battle cry. Right. And two minute two twos are not great, but they're not unplayable by any means, right? Uh, two minute. What's a two mana two two with some upside that we see? Knife Juggler, Ravasaurus Runt. Uh, this is probably no more similar to Tortolian Forager, where it gives sure. you a whole bunch of card advantage right off the bat. Except it's even better because it doesn't just give card advantage. That plus one plus one it doesn't come with an additional mana cost, so it gives more right. tempo later on. Uh, I mean, you do have to balance the fact that the Forager is guaranteed to give you the extra card, while this. Uh, you know, you have to meet a requirement to get the extra stats. Yeah, but the idea but, is you don't draft it in classes where you're drafting two drops. And you're never like... Yeah. Like, if you're just deciding not to get two drops, you're never that sad, right? Like, oh no, if in my non-two drop deck, I'm giving up an Acetic Swamp Ooze to take something else. Like, you're sad, but you're not like... It's not like you're giving up the best cards in the game. Right. Uh, so a card like this will be quite good for... Um, classes that were already control oriented and had removals right mm -hmm. and we'll see if it continues to be that way uh so as for right now this card you know you can definitely see it having a place in mages and priests where they have a, a lot of aoe's a lot of ways to respond and also uh, playable two mana cards that aren't minions that help them recover or keep up on the board yep that's fair yeah, you have a Power of the Wild, for example. It instantly makes you much more uh, able to play this card. That is a Druid. So, yes. Uh, I did not talk about the Druid, but... It, if you plan to bring, bring the Druid in, I totally understand. But I yeah. was talking about Mages and uh, Priest. Okay. <laughs> but, like, same idea, right? Like, no, you no have... same idea! You are just like, yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Power of the Wild is great. I'm like... <laughs> 
Uh, okay. Anyway, yeah. it's a two mana legendary. We don't see a lot of those, so that's kind of interesting. And it may indicate a new direction in which this expansion is going to have some lower mana cost legendaries, maybe. Uh, which we've always been in desperate need of, uh, especially since they got rid of um, the Fajolas and the other people uh, of the arena. Um, okay, so now we are looking at the only neutral card that, like, neutral uh, common slash rare that has been revealed. And it is not an exciting card. It, it's going to be a theme for this entire thing. They're just, it's just not a very exciting expansion. Like, most disappointed I've been in any expansion so far from the announcement. Uh, Shallow Gravedigger, 3 mana, 3-1. Three, death Rattle, add a random Death Rattle minion to your hand. It's kind of like a Moot Hoarder, except it, you know, instead of drawing something from your deck, you draw from a specific class of cards, right? And it's it just ends up being how good are Death Rattles. Uh, and I don't know yet. I have no idea because so, I'm assuming that there's going to be some death rattles. It's going to be a ton of death rattles coming. They said so. They said right. that this was going to be a death rattle themed expansion. Like death rattles are making a comeback. It's like taunts made a comeback in uh, in Angoro, right? Uh, Beasts made a big splash. Not even a comeback. They were never this frequent uh, in Angoro. It's kind of like that. We're going to have right. a, a death rattle theme in Angoro, which again is not very exciting. We've had death rattle themes before. Like I think yeah. I feel like we've had like at least Nax was Death Rattle themed. There was one more expansion I forgot which one that was pretty Death Rattle themed as well. Right. So what are you getting with uh, this card? You're getting about one and a half mana worth of stats, right? Um, like, and uh, you get a draw, and the draw is like I said, yet to be seen. But it's going to be bad. It's not from your. It's from your uh, a random card. It's not from your deck. It is it's going to be card. worse than from your deck because you haven't pre-selected for it. It's just right. going to be worse. This is like a worse Loot Hoarder. Loot Hoarder is 2-1. This is 3-1. You had an extra mana for the same vulnerability, and you get a worse draw. Like, And Loot Hoarder is not like the greatest card ever. It's like just a slightly above average card. This is going to be like a below average card, almost certainly. Yeah, almost certainly. And I totally agree, right? It differentiates itself from um, other cards like Stonehill Defender, you get to discover. So you get to choose. Uh, and that choice makes it quite powerful. Something like a Shimmering Tempest uh has almost similar stats and you get a random spell which is you know spells are good in the arena because they a lot of times give you initiative so also stonehill yeah. defender's body is better a 1-4 taunt yes. is way better than a 3-1 yes definitely uh the taunt is also extremely annoying mm -hmm. and coming down on turn three i because we never see silverback patriarch uh, but now I'm just like, wow. Well, there's already tentacles. Silverback Patriarch is not even the standard for neutral cards anymore, right? Like, it's, right, it's tentacles. Right. It is tentacles. But a lot of times, for example, if I have a Biofin Tidehunter out there, and then they play the yeah. Stonehill Defender, I'm like, wow, that thing is actually pretty it's freaking good. good. Against me, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we want to make a correction to Princess Keliseth. Um, Merz was talking about the no two cost minions, and I was jumping on board with that. But it's actually no two cost cards. Ah, oh, gotcha. So That's spells don't do anything. You gotcha. actually can't take two cost spells, so it actually limits you quite significantly in that aspect. That does change, uh, you know, uh, the way I, I was evaluating it. Right? Um, you can still certainly have cards that respond and if you're a mage you know you can just follow it up with volcanic potions right mm -hmm. and if you're a priest if you have a couple of potions of madness you're you're good on the early game but it does limit uh, your uh, draft options quite a bit after that. a lot more than yeah. i thought it did so, okay so, so it's way less good than we'll i thought it was yep fair all right now let's go to the actual new mechanic okay so i want to bring it back in, in that like if you look at um msg for example you had new mechanic of um, the hand buffs. You had uh, new mechanics of tri-class cards, right? Kind of a new mechanic. Uh, you sure. had Jade as a new mechanic. These are just like all new things no one's ever seen before, right? And then on top of that, you had like something like a potion theme, for example. Or you had, right. I don't know, like, I don't know, probably like some other themes. But that's, that's, um, that's MSG. In Angoro... You had a theme of like taunts and poison and beasts. You had a, quite a bunch of themes actually. But then you also had new mechanics of like adapt, of quests, of um, the uh, the the tar creeper stuff, right? Like where it's a different stat on your opponent's turn than on your turn. Um, 
these are like new things. You have like a whole bunch of new things in both of these expansions. And so we were like hoping for some new things in this expansion because Blizzard has been quite good about it. Um, and we may have been spoiled. I will bring this up because in like the three expansions before that, there was nothing new. Nothing in Karazhan, nothing in Old Gods. Um, okay, so nothing in Old Gods and in Karazhan. In LOE, there was the new Discover mechanic. So it was just Old Gods and Karazhan brought literally nothing new to the uh, to the game. Um, sorry, Old Gods brought one new thing, which is the Old Gods, but right, that was, was only say, a constructive was... mechanic. So yeah. literally no new things into the arena before we started getting new arena things. So maybe we're just going back, like we maybe we just had a good run with our last two expansions. But here's the the main new thing coming out with uh with this like frozen throne with KFT. It is lifesteal. They're they're pumping it up, they're hyping it up, they're they're saying this is the the new thing, and they're giving us two cards to talk about lifesteal. And this is the outside of the heroes, this is kind of the main new mechanic, is what they're saying. Um, and it's highly disappointing. What Lifesteal is, is whatever damage this card deals, it gives it to your face. So, it's Mistress of Pain. This is not new. We've had Mistress of Pain, we've had Ally Armorsmith, we've had, like, cards. We had that uh, Paladin Legendary. We have quite a few cards over the years that have given us Lifesteal. Now it's become a mechanic. So I'm not even calling this, this is not even a new mechanic. This is, like, poison, right? This is, like, another theme. Right, right. So we have a Death Rattle theme and we have a Lifesteal theme. Um, and lifesteal in the arena used to be pretty good, right? Like mistress of uh, mistress, I've you know I've been the champion of that card since forever. I've always given it a very high rating. It's gotten me many twelve win runs. Um, we also similarly like Ali Armorsmith and like you know whatever. But uh, these new cards suck. First, Spear Lash, two mana, deal one damage to all minions, which is Whirlwind. Whirlwind is a card. It is one mana. So what do you get for the extra one mana? Lifesteal. Yeah. Oh, to be fair, it is in a different class, right? And we've seen instances where um, similar cards, but for different classes, can be good. But at the end of the day, you just can't see this card being that great for Priest, mm -hmm. right? Double-sided, it, it definitely has some synergies, uh, potential, right? Mm -hmm. But not not great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, this this is synergistic, right? If you're a priest, you probably have a lot of heal synergies in a normal constructed deck. You don't in arena. In arena, your heals are good for warlock and rogue, and that's it. So, to the extent that life steal is kind of everywhere, your warlocks and rogues are going to be a bit better. Um, yeah, that, that's a priest card, and so I don't know. I don't know what it's doing. Like, sure, it fills up that role where like priests generally don't are not like able to ping, and so this is a way to ping, but it's a two mana way to ping. So it's a really crappy way to ping. So yes. It does fill yeah. something that priests can normally not do, but it's a really bad card to let you do it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and this card... It's bad. It's tough for me to evaluate because I don't see a lot of things out there right now, but or I don't see the rest of the cards that they've put out right now. Doesn't matter, yeah, still I bad. Can't imagine this. Uh, and I'm seeing some of the comments uh, like comparing it to other cards, like uh, I see one comparing to Maelstrom Portal. Maelstrom, Maelstrom Portal, Portal is, doesn't damage your own minions. It's one-sided. It gives you a one-drop, which is half of the value of the, the card. card. And you have access to spell power. Oh my god, it's so different. So different than Spear Lash. So, Not even close. Spear Lash is terrible. Those away, yeah. Oh no. Oh no. Really no, different. no. And yes, I agree. Maelstrom Portal is really good <laughs> like really 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 good no, no. Uh, not, not even the same not even close yeah not even close uh okay so the final card is chill when champ chill blade champion it is a uh paladin card and it is a four mana charger three two with life steal so keep in mind there's a neutral card that is not very good called wolf rider that is a three one charger with no life steal so for one extra health and life steal it costs one mana, and it's a class card only for paladins. You can tell the philosophy that Blizzard has been operating under ever since they've uh, nerfed like Patron Warrior and all that stuff, right? Where they don't like charge, and they're going to be extremely careful with charge. Mm -hmm. If they put out uh, something with charge, it'll either be for example, charge Devil Sword, where it costs a lot and there's a limitation on it, mm -hmm. right? It can't go face. 
or they're going to do something uh, like with uh, with this new car in which it's just pretty bad. You uh, need to synergize it. It needs to be right. buffed the turn it comes out or else it's worthless. Yeah. So uh, it, it's really, uh, once again, this is another card in which you'd really have to see some crazy other cars uh, that synergize with it in order for it to be good. But eh, that's it's a card that introduces the mechanic, yeah. right? Yep. Fine. Um, and there's a lot of cards that synergize with it for Paladin, right? Like any hand buff cards, any normal buff cards, any persistent on the board buff cards, like Wolf or like uh, Stormwind Champion or whatever. There's plenty of synergies for this kind of mechanic. Um, yeah. The problem is it's all synergies. So even if the synergy is pretty pervasive in Paladin and you're going to get a few uh, synergy cards just in a normal course of a draft, you kind of need like at least one tempo on it to begin with to even get its normal value back. Because keep in mind, Corcoran Elite is a generally good card. It's a format of 4-3. So this guy, to be like a good playable card, has to already be buffed by plus one, plus one. So it's only getting its value if it's buffed by like more than that. So it's less like, oh, look how many synergies I can find with it. More like, can you find two synergies with it before you play it? Because if so, it's good. If not, it's not so good. And right. keep in mind, if this were, it were any other formatic card, like if this card were not Chillblade Champion, but it was um, Corcoran Elite, that plus one, plus one would make it a 5-4 charger, which is way better than a 4-3 charger with Lifesteal. Yeah. So no matter at what point, right, like if you're looking at it like, oh yeah, look, it has Charge and Lifesteal. They both synergize with being buffed. So that's a really, that's like a double synergy. It's really good. Yes, it is. But the cost is already built in. You need to buff it quite a number of times before it becomes a normal card. Whenever you see a charge card now, recognize that Blizzard has, w when they're developing a charge card, they will have a uh, very, uh, they will have looked at it and play tested it even more than the other cards. You know, I, I don't know, like, I can't confirm this, but based on their philosophy about charge in general, I, I believe that uh they would be very very careful with charge yeah. and i think this is sort of the power level that they want right mm -hmm. where uh they've really tried to think of the cost and then they're like let's after they think of the cost they also uh want to err a bit more on the safe side as well yeah and this is what we get which for constructed i don't know you obviously you can pull out some crazy combos especially if you go into wild right you can do lots of crazy stuff in the arena uh it's just it is what it is you're gonna draft it sometimes but it's never gonna be a premium pick so what do you think what do you think is gonna happen with the rest of it let's make some predictions without knowing anything else about this expansion about how this expansion is going to impact the arena wild speculation time go sure so what we have seen so far in the past two expansions but most of all for Angoro is Angoro introduced power creep at a level that we have never seen before, mm -hmm. right? In terms of effects plus stats, a, uh, for example, Primordial Drake, right? Such a, uh, it's such a ridiculous card in the arena. The AOE, the body, the taunt, we, we haven't seen anything like that. Uh, another great example of just the power creep is Nesting Rock, or in your words, Nesting Row. Um, and Angora was really defined by these overstatted, really beefy cards. Tar Creeper is a great example of an early game, um, you know, overstatted minion, right? Uh, and I think we're going to go in the opposite direction for this expansion. First of all, if they're going to one-up themselves from Angora, yeah, if you guys thought <laughs> that was Tar Creeper, no, 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 you just can't do it because if you're if you're gonna go a step beyond Angoro, then the old god cards that came out, you never want to pick them anymore. Or the classic cards, you're just like, oh my god, I got non Angoro and non uh, KFT. Oh, I'm using it now. Non KFT it, it's cards. It's pretty catchy, right? KFT. Not really. It's not I like Journey to Angoro. Like JTU is not chicken. good. No, no, no. You're trying to. Uh, it, it's too close to KFC. What's wrong with so being close to KFC? Uh, I want to eat fried chicken but i kind of can't so yeah okay so that's it that's your that's personal crazy. burden it's yeah, my personal thing okay fine forget it we'll, we'll keep on moving so my prediction is um starting from uh the past two expansions blizzard has sort of stepped up their game right every single expansion they've introduced a lot of new mechanics new minion types 
um, you know, uh, sort of the three the three gangs. They've introduced elementals and quests. So what they provide in every single expansion is going to be a lot. I think we should expect the same number or not number, like same amount of content, but the power creep has been uh, increasing in both of the past expansions. I don't think they can continue down that route. So I think we're going to see a lot of tricky cards, a lot of, you know, combos, uh, combos, card draws. And this, you know, this is the way from the little bit we've seen the death rattle plus draw cards, uh, the lifesteal. We're going to see a lot of this uh, cute sort of uh, combo stuff to provide the same amount of content, the same interesting gameplay that they want without continue, uh, continuing down the power uh, creep road that they've been going down. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, basically, what Murps is trying to say is this expansion is going to suck for the arena. <laughs> Which is fine, okay? Because you know what no, happened with Ungoro? Yeah. Like, it feels weird. It's like this expansion is going to suck and then be like, everything's fine. Uh, but it is because I want this expansion to suck. I want it to be more interesting than it is. And maybe it will be, right? There's hopefully at least one mechanic that's new that's hidden somewhere. But here's why I think it's okay for this expansion to suck. And not just Murps is thinking about it from like a big picture, like, you know, how to balance the game perspective. I'm thinking about it from a player perspective what did Angoro do Angoro moved to standard first of all which was ridiculous right. it got rid of three expansions it launched its own expansion on the smallest card pool we have had since like gvg and it really changed everything so much arena was not recognizable right after Angoro and before Angoro. do we really want that to happen every four months no I think very clearly you don't want like that level of ridiculous change every four months. That level of ridiculous change happening once every year, like maybe keeps it fresh. Every four months, way too quick. You want to get skills in the arena, you want to be able to keep some of it, right? So it's good to have a stable basis to work off of. And that's what Old Gods did. It stabilized things, right? Old Gods was not terribly interesting, um, but it created a stable base of cards that we've been like using since then. And it created this new, um, slower style compared to the GVG, which was the old base, right? If GVG was the right, first base, right. Old Gods was the second base. And now Angoro has established the third base. And so we're building on the base, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have Angoro cards already in the meta. So the new cards, despite 135 of those cards coming out, are already going to be less influenced. There's not going to be an old, uh, old expansion rotating out. So just the overall impact of this expansion, it's definitely going to be felt, right? This is not an adventure. This is like a real hefty expansion. But it's not going to completely and totally irrevocably change everything we know about the arena. And by having cards that were also worse than usual, especially compared to Ungoro, it reinforces that. It makes the change even less. And that is all a good thing. That is all a good thing because you don't want a huge amount of change all the time. And I think we're still kind of settling in to this Angoro uh, kind of um, meta. And this is from people who play like a lot of uh, a lot of Arena too. Like that was really interesting to figure out and all that. And we're gonna shake it up again. But there's no need to to push it like you know in a totally different direction. So what I think is is going to happen is um, um, KFT. Uh, I, I love it. The more I say it, the more I love it. It's it's going to pull everything back. It's going to even out the arena offering rates so that the classic set cards will become better in comparison. Not in comparison to the Ungoro cards, but in comparison to the average cards you're going to see. And by classic cards, I mean the totally neutral stuff, right? Like your Yetis, your Raptors, your Shattered Sun Clerics, your Harvest Golems, or whatever. And at the same time, it's going to... Uh, Death Rattle, the focus on Death Rattle especially, like, has me very excited. Because what Death Rattle does is it allows aggro to stay on the board. Like, more than anything else, it allows aggro to stay on the board, and it allows control to have minions on the board, right? That's the whole point of Death Rattle. It's like, yeah, sure, the first Death Rattle we saw was a Death Rattle about drawing a card. But most Death Rattles are probably going to be some kind of tempo initiative. Especially because you already have a heal. Right? Like, you already have a heal mechanic. You're not going to make a death rattle heal you again. Um, so, with this comes more on-the-board play and more free on-the-board play because it's not a taunt focus. It's a death rattle focus. And taunts are limiting. They prevent you from being, from being able to decide where you're going to hit. Whereas death rattles provide the same amount of tempo manipulation on the board as a taunt, but it doesn't get rid of your opponent's choice. So both sides still have choice. Like, Taunt is a very advanced mechanic based on when you play it and how you play around it. But 
just normal stuff on the board will always give you more choice. And as a good player, you always want more choice. You want your opponents to have more choice. You want you to have more choice. Just more choice, the better. So the focus on Death Rattle allows you to have a, a larger, more consistent presence on the board than just normal minions, the same way taunts do, really. But it also gives you more choice. So I really like the focus on Death Rattles, even though I don't think they're going to make it terribly powerful. Like, for example, you remember Sludge Belcher? Yeah. I don't think they're going to make anything like Sludge Belcher again, because they're having so much trouble with that card being in every constructed deck. They're just, they're not going to go in that direction. Sludge Belcher, yeah, it, it's crazy, right? It was also an underrated card uh, when people were like, oh, it's just Senjin with uh, a gold chart footman, yeah. right? And Senjin is played, but it wasn't a super premium, and no one plays Goldshire Footman, so this stinks. And it's just like, remember when we were doing Silverback Patriarch evaluations and we rated it super high? And a lot of people actually criticized this for it. Are you it talking about like, Silverback Patriarch or are you talking about something sorry, that looks sorry. like a Silverback Patriarch? No defender. Right. I was like, if we rated Silverback <laughs> Patriarch high, then people should criticize. It. No, but people were just like, yeah, it's uh, Stonehold Defender is just a Silverback Patriarch with a discover mechanic. It's like, just the discover mechanic yeah you can't just write it off like that right but uh you know because you said that it would be hilarious if they just brought back sludge belcher and piloted shredder oh and my zombie God. chow in, different, with, in like with undead like, forms right with like a different hat literally <laughs> a different hat right uh and they call undead it undead shredder and, and it's it may not have loved, no, ever been living to die in the first place but it will now be undead yeah, uh, so Zombie Chow will now be a uh, Combi Zao or something, <laughs> and it will be a Zombie Chow with a different hat, right? Uh, piloted Shredder uh, will, I don't be piloted Mower or something, and it will be, a you know, with a different hat. And that would just be the ultimate troll from Blizzard. I'm looking forward to this. Now I'm actually pretty excited for the expansion. Uh, wow. Okay, well, we'll see We'll see if that happens. Um, okay. So yeah, basically, you heard it yeah, you heard it here first. Uh, new old cards are coming back. But really, I think our overall theme that you should take away from KFT uh, is that it's going to suck. And that's okay. So <laughs> expect it to suck and expect it to be okay. And I don't know how I feel about the hero cards being in the arena in like a large frequency, but I guess we don't really have much of a say in it, so we'll find out. Uh, how, yeah. how frequent it's going to be in the arena and what impact it'll have. Um, it's going to be interesting, though. Like, that's going to be the biggest shakeup, I feel, unless they actually have a mechanic up their sleeve that they just didn't feel like it was necessary to inform the rest, you know, to, like, actually roll out with the beginning. But everything else was rolled out, right? Like, MSG rolled out with both the Jade and the hand buff mechanic. Um, Ungoro rolled out with the Adapt right off the bat uh, and the Quest. Yep. So all the like things that they consider really new, I think they like start they like you know lead with it. So I really don't think there's any like real new mechanic. Just like maybe small things like the Tar Creeper stuff or like the the Hog Rider stuff, where it's like oh yeah, this actually changes. You know, there's actually a new function in the in the game, but it's only on a few cards, and you know they don't look at it as a huge part of the expansion. Right. So just to be clear, and I see some people might um, not understand. Or, or not see the difference. When we say the new expansion is going to suck, we don't mean, number one, that we're not looking forward to it, and number two, the expansion experience will no, suck. No, no, we're no, saying yeah. The expansion is going to be pretty good. We're saying the power level yeah. of the cards, the cards are is predicted suck. to be lower, yeah. and that's it. And what, even when we say the new cards will suck, we don't mean they won't be fun or they won't be... We're I saying, like sucky cards. <laughs> Up to a yeah. certain extent. Although, I, mean, I think this, this expansion is, is going to test how sucky the cards right. could get. So, <laughs> understand, when we say the new expansion is going to suck, it is shorthanded for the power level that we have seen from past expansions, especially on Goro, is going to be lower. Significantly. That, significantly. And that is what we mean by the new expansion yeah. is going to suck. I'm not saying, like, get dehyped for it, but, like, it depends on what you yeah. have fun with, right? If you have fun with, like, putting out extremely powerful cards, like, meteoring your opponent, I feel like you're going to be disappointed in this expansion. But if you have fun, like, playing technicals or, like, improving or whatever, like, we need an expansion that kind of sucks. Like, we really yeah. do. Because, um, and, and don't think that's going to not, like, like I said, right, it's going to shake up the arena. Every, anytime you put 135 cards in the arena, it's going to really shake up the arena. Especially when you give it an offering bonus. Like, really shake up the arena. It's just not going to, like, change the entire, like, underlying premise of the game. Yep. 
So those are sort of the new mechanics for the expansion. And now we're in this waiting period, right? Two week waiting we period wait. before new information, followed by a two week waiting period before the expansion. This is the new Basically. Blizzard rollout. All right, so uh, that's the last time you're going to hear us talk about KFT until uh, until two weeks from now. Well, sorry, good. three weeks from now, because Light Forges only happen every week. So it's going to be three weeks until we talk about this again. We're going to be just like Blizzard. We're going to set it aside and not worry about it. But this is fairly exciting. We know a new expansion is coming, and we should expect the new expansion to hit. Oh, yeah, we know the date. In... I think they actually announced the date this time, right? It's not even like yeah, up to I guesswork. Know. I think they said it was going to be like August 8th. Oh, was it? I, I the, you, you, you want to make sure of this before. Okay, you, you so I don't know 100%, but um, the basically they announced that they're not going to announce more information until the 24th. And I think the assumption is that they're going to take two weeks to build up hype. So then the card dump is going to be on the 4th, and then it's going to launch either the 7th or the 8th. And I think they confirmed, okay. well, no, they confirmed that it was going to launch in August. That's what they confirmed. Okay, so that's very far from what you're saying. Okay, like, but I'm calling it, I'm calling it the 8th, right here. Uh, Blizzard okay, can you're, you're Blizzard can listen or they cannot, but I'm saying it's the eighth. Okay. All right. Anyways, uh, and I think that makes sense just based on uh, the timeline that you've given, right? Yep. It, it makes sense. And now watches it's like end of August, very last day. <laughs> uh, all right. So that's the news about the expansion. Obviously, very happy to uh, get anything about the expansion because we've been in the Angoro meta for long enough. And uh, I'm sure we'll say the same thing about KFT in, you know, four months from now, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, at least for right now, we just play the waiting game and hope the expansion comes uh, in the blink of an eye. Yeah, and okay, we're going to get to this after after uh, a bunch of other stuff. But like, it's not like the meta is not fresh right now. Because like I said, Angoro changed the meta way too much. And on top of that, they just did an offering bonus change in the beginning of June. So we're actually in a new meta. Like, we've yep. been in a new meta for a bit. And it actually does feel different. It's felt different since the beginning of June. But no one could really put their finger on it. Or, like, some people did, but no one else believed them. Including us. We were part of the non-believers. We were like, let's wait to get more information. Uh, and then Blizzard was like, here. Here's the information. We did change things. So um, we've been in this new meta for not not too long. And I think it'll, it'll continue to be, like, fresh and playable until the expansion is released. Right. Blizzard shaking up the meta in interesting ways is welcome, but like I said last time, we'd appreciate them telling us. Yeah, right? tell us when you're making the change, not two weeks after. Uh, anyway, moving on. Arena leaderboard. The leaderboard Arena for what has happened in June in the uh, new meta that no one knew was the new meta. is out. That no one knew was the new meta. Uh, so, leaderboard is out again. Congratulations to... Uh, a lot of familiar faces, streamers, and personality. Uh, Crip uh, is number one. number one. Congratulations to Crip. First two-time uh, number one in the history of the leaderboard, which the history of the leaderboard has not been for that long. But if you which, remember, he was uh, number one when the leaderboard first came out in January. In January, yes. So Crip is number one. Once again, the only And with a much lower uh, win rate, too. So he's, like, upped his win rate, like, quite significantly. Yes. Uh, so Crip is at number one. Big congratulations to Crip. Isherwood is at number two. Uh, vi like, this is incredible, I think. Crip at number one, Isherwood at number two. It really just goes to show um, their, not only their skill, but their consistency, mm -hmm. right? Isherwood, even though he has not been number one on NA, Isherwood has been number one on Asia and has placed very, very high on NA multiple times. Uh, his consistency is something that uh, is when just when you really were number incredible. when you were number like nine or whatever you were tied with Isher right was that Isher I was tied with Isher. you were tied yeah. with Isher when you were For number nine way. yeah uh, so moving down the list we have twelve wins HS or Victor at number eighteen once again really great Victor uh, was number one on EU uh, a while back and with like that ridiculous win rate right nine point. I forget. I love how these uh, are just but, people that we've all interviewed on the Light Forge before for various whatever reasons. <laughs> uh, another familiar face, Hafu at number 19. Really? Uh, just once? She's not on there three times? What happened? If she's on there three times, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it's probably like shiny pants or something, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, so, Dreads, uh, yeah, sorry, 20. Keep going. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Let let me finish this up first. Dreads at number 20. Uh, Dr. Stein at number 46. We have Amaz at number 65. And look, I'm probably forgetting a lot of people, but those uh, want to give these shout outs. And I'm sure there's more out there as well. Yeah, and keep in mind, the arena leaderboards are now like up to 150. Uh, instead of 100 that was a, a change that they didn't really announce but they just had to do it. and now it's in the same like format presented as the standard and wild leaderboards which gives it even more legitimacy right it's not like just a separate thing uh like a separate web page it's actually the same web page on a different tab um and if you guys are wondering crypt got 8.37 wins per run it's insane Isherwood got 8.13, which is also insane. Someone whose name was so bad that they had to censor him and change his name, so he's now Bnet player. By the way, if you ever see Bnet player and you're facing them, that's because Blizzard changed their name because it was offensive in some way. Um, got 8.0, and those are your top three. And it drops off a bit after that into the, the seven wins. And if you want to be top 100 on NA, you need to have a 6.8 win per run. And there's like 20 play- 15 players uh, on there um with that exact win rate and if you want to be just on the leaderboard at all it is 6.63 so it's definitely doable i think for uh for a lot of our listeners and a lot of our viewers even if you are not on and i know for a fact that there is like at least a dozen listeners of the light forge that are on this leaderboard have that contacted me you know in some way or shape you're like hey i'm like number you know whatever on the leaderboard so yeah. congrats, congrats to everybody, and you know also some other names here that we recognize just from uh, right. just from our chat and from our subs. So uh, it's just nice seeing all the people um, on there. Like it really makes the community feel like fairly tight, right? Like right. if if you care about the arena to play this much, like a lot of the people who do that at least are either in the community being streamers or whatever, or they're participating in the community being like viewers and people, you know, like hanging out in Twitch chat telling me when I make misplays. Um, also the, the Meow Clan, uh, want to give them a shout out, have number six and seven. They are the sure. Chinese clan that is invading, has been invading the arena leaderboards uh every every season and placing quite well throughout uh throughout the right i didn't give them a shout because at this point it's just you just assume there's a few people you just assume that a lot of people from the meow clan will be placing quite highly right and once again they uh have placed quite highly uh and spending lots of time to come over to our side of the pond it's good though it's good i love i love when they do that and i like i I like that one that they're here and they're doing really well and i also like that they're here and they're not number one because it gets embarrassing (laughs) if they're just like come and they're number one and number two and number three every single season right i'm sure they're trying to gun for it because isher got number one in asia so oh but that's not no meow clan's from china they're not even on the asia servers the separate servers yeah china has separate servers so they don't feel threatened by that. It's not like Isher went to China and got number one. That would make waves. Ooh. First of all, that would have been hard just to get on the China <laughs> server. Yeah. But, yep. So those are the leaderboards. And as of our recording, the leaderboard for EU has not been out yet. I'm sure we'll see a lot of familiar faces on there as well. But Blizzard is slow on these things. Really? So. Blizzard is slow and has issues technically with the EU servers? Crazy, right? I will say for this month, uh, they came out with the leaderboards uh, really fast. quite early. Yeah. yeah, pretty early. So it's kind of understandable that we haven't seen EU, but not understandable when you think of the fact that they released NA and then it's been a long time mm-hmm. and they still haven't released EU. Anyways, that's that for the leaderboard. Congratulations to all those involved and good luck to all of those participating this month. Cool. So what's up next? We got a question from the GOAT. Uh, question from the GOAT. This one is taken from two weeks ago when we recorded. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like ages ago. But this question is from uh, mherrick84 on Twitter. Uh, Matt asks, what's the better value? Slightly above arena run average for the purposes of discussion, 3.5 wins versus or uh, versus buying packs outright? Um, and I think this is a, an important question because when we talk a lot of the times, we talk from our perspective as infinite arena players who don't really care about gold. And I think a lot of times we project that onto the audience, right? Yep. Uh, which is definitely not the case. Uh, and I think most people uh, are in this kind of situation where they obviously love the game. They want to spend their gold as efficiently as possible. They probably play constructed 
uh, more or the same amount as mm -hmm. Arena. And they're thinking, well, what's the better value? And I think this is a great question. Okay, so have you done the math on this? Uh, I know there's math out there. I have not. It, it turns it turns out you have. So. Okay. So the math value on this is even the average win rate, say 3.5, um, even counting the extra 10 and like 13 gold you would technically get if you played constructed um, for those times, that's assuming you don't max your constructed daily, like, you know, uh, gold allocation. Because remember, you get 10 gold per win in constructed and you don't get that in arena. So even counting all of those... You get 10 gold per three wins. Per three wins, sorry. Yeah, you get 10 gold per three yep. wins. So even counting all of those in if you get like slightly more than three wins per run and of course i'm also building in the dust value as like some kind of value i know some people are just purely concerned with gold but you're presumably using gold to get packs most of which you'll dust anyway so i'm counting some value for the dust that you're going to get uh you will be better off playing arena than playing constructed not counting the end of the um end of uh end of season rewards so if you count the end of season rewards, then constructed becomes better than arena up until like four ish wins or whatever, depending on how much you play, right? Um, right. So the idea is, if you the more constructed you play, the more worth it it is for arena because you're already getting to your end of season rewards, right? Like it's not like you get more end of season rewards for playing more. You don't. You get it for whatever rank you're at. So. Um, because for constructed players, it is more worth it to play arena. If you're a pure arena player. Um, the rewards are actually like relatively speaking less so if you're just purely trying to maximize you actually want like this like balance between like constructed and arena which uh which is fair i think that's what blizzard's trying to get at right there's also the long-term strategy of if you want to be infinite then the path to getting infinite uh is paved with many many arena runs mm -hmm. right so there's also the added benefit of you play an arena run, you're going to get better. You play a lot of arena runs, you're going to get a lot better. And you're going to bump up that average from 3.5 to yep. 4 to 5 to 6. And that's when it really becomes worth it, right? So it's also a long-term investment in your knowledge, in your experience there. At the same time, you know, if you're buying packs and you just want to focus on constructed as well, and buying packs gets you closer to building the deck that you want to grind the ladder with uh, and get better there then there's extra consideration there. But for long term, every arena run gets you closer to going infinite in arena, which is, you know, just, just infinite value, right? Yup. Um, I think that's a, that's a pretty thorough answer. Um, yep. And uh, we're going to move on to the second half of our programming because it's going to be a long ass light forge. Um, and now we're going to go to actually playing the game. Because we were talking like about the future and about the leaderboards and all that. But we're not going to leave you like we did last time with no gameplay tips. Uh, but before we get to that, I just want to bring up one thing. I'm going to turn it into a gameplay tip. But really, it's about Vicious Fledgling. There was this like huge uproar. This ridiculous uproar about how Vicious Fledgling is destroying the arena in particular. And then uh, Mike Den Denise, Den Denises? Denise? I can't pronounce. He's like a card to me because I don't know him as like a human being. You can, uh, let's just call him Mike. Okay. So Mike D, who is a, you know, senior um, uh, card card developer, game developer on the balance team, does arena stuff. Um, uh, before Ixar kind of took over uh, that role, or at least mostly took over that role, he was like the main like speaking contact for what little information they provided about the arena. Uh, he came out and he said, all right, Vicious Fledgling will be halved at some point in the future in the offering rates. So that's happening. And this fits with the Blizzard philosophy of if you complain about a card long enough, hard enough for the arena, like Flamestrike, like Abyssal Enforcer, its offering rate will get halved. That's just yeah. what will happen now. Um, it's very clear. There's no like real pattern here, right? Like other board clears are still in the game. Um, other snowball cards that even snowball harder than Vicious Fledgling are still in the game. But, you know, Vicious Fledgling is getting cut. And... Obviously, we disagree with how they're doing this. Obviously, we know why they're doing this. We're just presenting the information here, and I'm going to tell you how to play against Vicious Fledgling. Um, personally, I don't think Vicious Fledgling is a problem balance-wise. It's more of a problem tilting-wise, right? Like, it makes people yeah. feel really badly. It's not terribly good card design. I don't like the card. Um, but balance-wise, it's definitely not one of the most powerful cards I'm looking at right now on our tier list. And we had misvalued this card in the beginning, too, along with, like, 
I think most people, even though I think we even misvalued it even lower than most people did. But uh, once we fixed that in the first week, we had not changed it like since because it's been fine. Uh, 113 is our score, which is lower than the new Toxic Sewer Ooze after the weapon change, lower than Glutinous Ooze, lower than Stonehill Defender, Tar Creeper, Giant Wasp when it comes to three drops. It's lower yeah. than all of those cards. And that is because, partly because we evaluate it from an infinite player's perspective and RNG is bad, and relying on one card to win the game is really good if the one card wins the game, if your win rate is 50%, if your win rate is 75%, obviously one card winning the game has a lower impact, right? That's just obvious stuff. And one of the reasons why it's rated lower for us, I think for most people, um, but even more, more than that, it's just, it's not game changing in the following situations, right? Your opponent has a 3-2 on the board, and you play a 3. You are the second player to play a 3-drop, and your opponent has a 3-2 on the board or a 3-3 three, three on the board. Your opponent has some kind of removal that's 3 mana or less that deals 3 damage or the damage plus whatever they have on the board. In those cases, which is like the vast majority of cases, by the way, your Vicious Fledgling will not flap. And when it doesn't flap, it's just a 3-3 three, three and nothing happens to it. And it is right. like quite... Low value. Just to give you an idea of what a 3-3 three, three is worth to us, a 3-3, three, three, like a normal 3-3, three, three, South Sea Captain, for example, is an 82. Murloc War Leader is an 84. That's pretty bad. 3-3s three, are horrible in this meta uh, because of 3-2s being the uh, favored 2-drop. Um, so, okay. And and the, uh, the uh, yeah, okay. So that's, that's the story about why it's just like not a very good card. Now, if you don't have those, those are kind of the obvious answers, right, for Vicious Fledgling being dropped early. The non-obvious answer, which I do all the time to, like, great success. And by great success, I mean still managing to win, like, two-thirds of the time, which is pretty good success if the opponent's Vicious Fledgling is, like, already flapping on you, right? Because you have, like, what, a 25% chance it ends up in that situation? And then if you have another two-thirds chance for you to still win the game after that, then Vicious Fledgling is causing you a very minor, like, amount of a losing rate. And that's if it comes out on turn three. Um, and what that is, is to totally ignore the Vicious Fledgling. Just play large minions, force your opponents to either remove them or force the Vicious Fledgling to get the correct RNG to be able to live through it. And then eventually combo it with either a larger removal or a board clear or something like that. So basically let the Vicious Fledgling flap. You will lose a more amount of health than you probably want to or should, but you're still alive and the Vicious Fledgling is dead. And this entire time that the Vicious Fledgling is flapping onto your face, what it's not doing is touching your board. And what that means is your opponent just conceded all initiative to you. Yeah. That's huge. Your opponent basically took his decision-making ability out of the game, put it to RNG of what is generating a fledgling, and then gave you all the initiative. Remember, it's the arena. Outside of trying to get card advantage, all you're ever trying to get is more and more initiative. And especially as a good player, you want even more initiative. And when your opponent has a vicious fledgling, he just gives you all that initiative for free. Like, from the three drop on, he's not attacking your board. Yeah, I, I think, look, this is stuff that we've talked about before, right? Vicious Fudge has been a card good bad. We've talked about the card as well. And I think at this point, people recognize the downsides of Vicious Fudge and why it is not rated higher, why it is not completely overpowered. Um, I, I think the with this decision, it just goes back to what we've seen with Flame Strike and Abyssal Enforcer, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that it feels really bad for people to lose to... Uh, the, it felt really bad for people to lose to those cards previously. Uh, and, and then, you know, they printed stuff, something like Dragonfire Potion, which you lose the same way, but whatever. People didn't complain so much about that. But this is people uh, pe like sort of the complaint of the day, right? The complaint du jour. People complain about Vicious Fledgling, not because it is overpowered uh, on average, right? If you just take, you can always post on Reddit situations where it becomes completely insane and you have like a 7-7 seven, mm. seven win fear that cannot be targeted with a Divine Shield. No, I mean, it will flat out win you the game X percent of the time. Right. Like, just that's what the card does. That's what the card does. And I will, and I've said this before. It is bad design, mm -hmm. and it is not, quote, healthy for the arena, right? Mm -hmm. I, because of the bad design, I don't think it is healthy for the arena, but it is not overpowered. And the thing that I don't like is, once again, this decision has shown that Blizzard will respond to the loudest complaint, which 
I look at the end of the day. Do I care so much about vicious fledgling? No, no. 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 But I don't like the fact that they could totally get rid of vicious fledgling, and I'd be totally fine with it. It's fine, whatever. Like I said, I don't think it is a healthy card for the arena. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't, you know, swing it one way or the other. But this is a decision that Blizzard has made once again that makes me uncomfortable, right? Because it is just sort of mob mentality pushing them and saying okay this doesn't make you guys feel good fine we'll take it away and not only is it confirmed grin and goat does not care about your feelings no <laughs> we, like i want a better future for the game and i think decisions like this are not as good for the game because what it also does but doesn't is it make people feel better and wouldn't well, that be better for the game if players feel better Oh, this is, uh, I don't know if people will feel better necessarily. What people will feel is that when they don't like something, they are ready to get their pitchforks even faster, right? Yep. Because they've seen it work. Like, Well, it, it does it, work. It's, it's confirmed to work. But Mike it's, specifically it's, said that that is the specific reason. The specific reason why we're lowering vicious fledging is people complain too much about it. But that's right. the reason. It wasn't because it was like... OP yeah. or like whatever, it's just no, like you need the HS replay stats on it. It it does not sig increase your win rate as much as so uh, you many think other it. cards. So yeah. many other cards. We're talking like for, not like a handful card. of cards. We're talking like scores of cards. But this is like okay. I I'm gonna make an analogy that some people might not like because I'm comparing them to something not so great. But this is like you have a kid that just like whines and complains all the time, and what should you do? You shouldn't reward them for it. Like if you reward them for it, they're gonna cry and whine more about it, and you're just creating bad habits. The uh... end effect for vicious fledgling, I don't really care about because I don't think it changes the game significantly. Once again, as one card. But I don't like them rewarding this, and I don't like the direction uh, they're going with this. Uh, it, it just means, like, next time, whatever card it is, and there will be something like this in the new expansion, or they'll go back and, you know, hate on Dragonfire Potion, right? And yeah, you can expect it to be nerfed. That's it. Like, we should expect whatever people get their pitchforks about to be nerfed, and people will always get their pitchforks out because that's sort of the, the cycle of the game. So I'm going to take a different perspective on this, and I'm going to actually do it from your example. Sure. In your example, there's a kid, and the reason that you're supposed to discipline your kid in certain ways and not in other ways is because your kid is being held hostage. Kids are always at the hostage of their parents. They can't pick new parents. They're not allowed to. On the true, other hand, true. players of Hearthstone, especially of the arena, they can pick new parents. They can no longer play the arena and just play Constructed if they don't feel good playing the arena. They can play a whole different game. It may not even be a Blizzard game. So I think where your example falls apart, because I agree with you about kids. I think we should do horrible things to them. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to players, I think you have to accept the fact that players have choices. And if you don't treat your players and make your players feel good, they will leave you. And if they leave you, that is presumably bad for the arena because you have bad players and you have less, you know, interest in the game. And then there's, you know, it's obviously bad for Blizzard because they get less money. So that's why I think your example kind of, I don't disagree, I don't agree with you that we shouldn't care about how people feel. I think we should care about how people feel, not from a competitive perspective, but from a health of the game perspective. Like, I think that's actually a tension between what's good for making the game like a better game versus what's good for making Hearthstone like, a better environment or like make more money or become bigger right because we all want arena to become bigger too in addition to become a more competitive and more like skill-based game so there's a tension there uh, what i'm more concerned about is why is it not consistent i'm more concerned about the dragonfire potion thing or like the shadow flame kind of thing where if you nerf something because the community is outraged at it i don't even mind that too much that's going to happen to a certain extent even if it's just like you know let's say the, the bad players are complaining about it or like you know even the good players are complaining about it fine nerf it but then nerf all the cards similar to it too have some kind of consistent policy basically don't make exceptions make rules and then follow your rules because what's actually impacting the arena is not vicious fledgling it is a type of card that single-handedly wins you the game that has I don't know, limited... Vicious Fledging is so weird because it doesn't even have limited counterplays. It has so much counterplays. But, like, I guess the idea is just one card that could single-handedly win you the game in a large percentage of situations. Like, large sure. enough percentage of situations for average players, right? 
And in that case, get rid of Deathwing. You know, get rid of like a whole bunch of cards that will single handedly win you the game with, you know, regardless of a lot of things that your opponent can or can't do. Like, be consistent with it. I don't care if ultimately the arena is going to not have all these, like, potentially snowball or potentially super powerful cards. I think that's fine. I think that's better for skill. Vicious Fledgling is not a skill card. I keep saying that, right? Like, Vicious Fledgling is better for bad players than for good players. I want a gun. But I want all these other cards gone too, because they are bad for the same reason that Vicious Fledgling is bad. And Blizzard is just not thinking. They're not using their heads. What they're doing is they're saying, you complain, I get rid of. Not, you complain, why do you complain? Let's make the game even better than what your specific complaint is by getting rid of all the things you don't like. Get rid of all the things that make you feel bad. I'm all aboard the feel bad train, right? I don't want players to feel right. bad, but there are things that players actually feel bad about that they are not vocalizing. And I think right. Blizzard right. should go one step further. So I think Blizzard's not going far enough when it comes to players complaining and then removing cards. I think they should start removing cards from the arena before players complain about it. No, no I, I think we're, uh, we are on the same page about this. So w w you explained that the difference between the parenting example is that they can choose, uh, in the gaming world, you know, if we're using this example of kids and parents, the kids can choose dif different parents, right? Um, my, the, the real complaint I had is it is just bad parenting. You know, if we're using the same analogy, it's just bad to say, okay, you complain about this and I am going to use the easy way out, right? Mm -hmm. The worst, this is like the worst thing you do. Not to not really, and you can differentiate You're not this helping with the like, kid is basically with the, like the, the Overwatch complaint. team, right? Uh -huh. Like a lot of people complain about Overwatch. How many times have you heard uh, complaints about a long time ago, Reinhardt being too prevalent in the meta? in the meta, yep. Right. Uh, and now you hear a lot of complaints about Mercy, right? How uh, yep. it's not fun and a lot of complaints. But what o the Overwatch devs don't do is say, okay, everyone complained about Reinhardt. We're going to lower his shield. We're going to do all this yep. stuff. Everyone complains about Mercy. We're going to, you know, nerf her res, nerf her uh, They nerf whatever. very tiny things about it that were like basically bug fixes. What do they do instead? They do, quote, good parenting. They keep the community involved. They explain the reasons for doing this. And what they say is, we hear your complaint. We're not going to do specifically the things that you say, but we are. Go we keep on working on this stuff, and you know things will work out because we're putting so much work into it. Which it did. You don't see Reinhardt that much anymore, right? Mm -hmm. it's, you see a lot of Winston's, and the meta organically changed. And to some degree, I have faith that it'll happen with uh, the Mercy meta yep. that we see now. Right? Uh, I agree. I think Overwatch is very good parenting. And I want to bring up one thing, which is that a lot of people have complained about the recent uh, Roadhog nerfs in, uh, in Overwatch. Roadhog's a hero that basically gets one-hit kills with very little skill involved if your opponent is, like, slightly out of position or if you flank them. And he's like a tank. He's not supposed to do that or whatever. Um, but most importantly, it, like, dominated the lower metas, right? Like, you cannot recommend someone not play a Roadhog in gold and below. It's just stupid to not have a Roadhog. Because in Golden Below, people are just always slightly out of position. That's why they're in Golden Below, right? Um, and Roadhog punishes that very quickly, very finally, and um, just, you know, in a way that doesn't take anywhere near as much skill as it takes to not position badly. Right. So, well, no, no one cared about Roadhog. If you were, like, even, like, more than a little decent at the game, you didn't care too much about Roadhog. You may be annoyed by him, but you were fine with it. But then a lot of, like bad players really or like super casual players really felt like it was not fun and they weren't even too loud about it but they've been talking about this for a very long time and eventually at some point blizzard nerfed uh blizzard nerfed roadhog's ability to one hit ko uh just kind of out of nowhere no one thought there was any real problem with it the, the thing had died down but they did it for design reasons and that's what i'm talking about Blizzard right. was not sitting there being like, oh, you're complaining about roadhog really heavily let's change him it was i think we've actually fixed roadhog but there was a design issue in Roadhog in the very premise that we will never ever be able to fix, which is that we don't want people to be punished really heavily for very difficult to do things while the Punisher has a very easy time to do the punishing. And it's only in right. one hero. We just don't want that as the design choice because it becomes impossible to balance at lower ranks. And so what do we do? We found the root issue, not the one people were complaining about because people complain about stuff that's unfun and they're not very smart about the game. But we thought about it way more. We figured out the root issue and we got rid of the root issue even though it wasn't really a nerf that too many people were asking for. And the counter reaction, we probably were expecting to be louder than the actual like problems we give with. But we're gonna do it anyway we're gonna bite the bullet why 
because we're making the game better from the ground up. We have found out what was actually not fun about the game, and you guys won't thank us for it now, but eventually you will because this is going to affect all of game design. Blizzard is doing none of that. They're not even trying to do that. They're saying whatever's loudest, Reinhardt gets nerfed, Mercy gets nerfed, whatever, right? It's, right. it's lazy and it has a certain amount of effectiveness, but it's not improving the game in the way that it could. Right. No. So at the end of the day, we are in total agreement. Like when I use my example, uh, and then you said, you know, uh, it's a little bit different because Blizzard has to care about uh, sort of what, what their kids think, right? Like, that, and that's true. But I think both of us at the end of the day state that it it isn't an excuse at the end for quote bad parenting. Like, mm -hmm. you still need to. And at the end of the day, I just hate the fact that they're not really addressing or if they're internally addressing it they're not telling us and they haven't really historically been addressing the design issues around it yep. right they are just sort of you know be like oh you're angry about this i will spit like a, a, what you want is a nerf i will give that exactly to you what you want is a nerf to these things okay fine you got it and it doesn't address what you're talking about the fundamental core stuff mm -hmm. or you know establishing rules and it doesn't talk about future wise how no. it impacts the design no, so no one knows no one knows it is just sticking a lollipop into the kid's mouth for now and then saying okay that's it you're not crying anymore i mean at the end of the day it just shows like they're not fixing the game right like no. that's not their goal their goal is sur superficial surface level appeasement yeah and in Which, that sense, it does fix the game a little, but it's not as good as it could and should be, and that other Blizzard teams are doing and have done from the very beginning. Anyway, let's move on from this. We talked a lot about Overwatch. We talked a lot about Vicious Fledgling. We talked a lot about Blizzard <laughs> balancing. Let's talk about the meta right now. We're about to play Rogue after this, and the tier list has been shifting a bunch, which usually doesn't happen in the late part of the meta, but because there was this whole weapons thing, and... Uh, and Blunt's Blizzard announced that we moved some classes around. But right now, our tier list stands at Rogue, then Paladin, then Mage, then Hunter, then Shaman, Druid, Priest, all the same rank, and then Warlock, Warrior, all the same rank. So we're going to talk about three topics here. Um, one is, why is Rogue on top? Two is, we lowered Shaman recently to be the same as Druid and Priest. Because you think, hey, weapon buff, Shaman has weapons, really good weapons. In fact, all of Shaman's weapons are really good. It should be, like, a little better, right? And that just hasn't quite panned out. And then, why is Warlock and Warrior on the same rank now? Is Warrior no longer the worst class? And I'm going to argue that Warrior is no longer the worst class in the meta. All right. Ooh, Start with okay. Rogue. So, look, Rogue tried and true class it's been near the top of the meta if not the top of the meta for a long time one of the reasons that i like it right now um is number one the flexibility right the flexibility has always been there the hero power is the best hero power in the early uh and you know sort of mid game as well but it has a great matchup against paladins great and it matchup. has a very good matchup uh against mages mm -hmm. as well right uh, so what the rogue is able to do is uh, it has the efficient removals for Paladin and it denies them the early board. So you have the temple plays to keep the Paladin off the board and you have your saps, your assassinates, and all of your removals, Vile Spine Slayers, to deal with the uh, Spike Ridge Steeds and Dino Sizes, right? And with your ability to uh, tempo out and to get on the board faster, you can also deny the Paladin those buffs in the first place. Uh, so I like the Rogue's matchup against Paladin, which is very popular. Lots of people are playing Paladin. Lots of people are seeing the win rates of Paladin, right? And uh, from the latest data, Paladins have the highest win rates, but that is across the board. Um, so I do really like Rogue. I think if you play Rogue effectively, which admittedly is very, very hard, uh, Rogue is a very difficult class to pilot. You have lots of tough choices starting from turn one and turn two, but because of the favorable matchup against Paladin, I think it is uh, in a really good place right now. Yep, I think the key is the favorable matchup against the Paladin, because the thing with the Paladin is it's always been like pretty easy to play relative to the other classes, and it's one of the things that's most attractive about it, but it's also one of the things that's made it a very popular class. 
And when it's good, it is a really popular class. There are more paladins out there right now than anything else. And so when you have a class that counters that class, that's very powerful. And uh, I know a lot of people think, well, weapons got buffed. Rogues, you know, have questionable weapons. Like, yeah, they have a Perdition's Blade, but then they also have Assassin's Blade, and they have, like, Obsidian Shard, and just weapons that you don't necessarily want to see offered all that much. And that's true. I don't think the weapons buff really helped uh, Rogue. If anything, it increased the value of all those weapon removal things, and that hurts Rogue. But what it also did is it removed the amount of hard removals Rogues get. Because the problem with Angoro Rogue, it's a really stupid problem, it's that they had too many hard removals. They were just offered so many Venom weapons, so many Vile Spine Slayers, and you add that to Assassinates and Saps and whatnot, that there's not actually enough big things to remove for the Rogue. And so reducing the hard removal like numbers actually favored the Rogue in a weird way. And what's even more favoring the Rogue is that the power level of the Rogue in Angoro was all concentrated in these like really hard removal cards. Now that that offering bonus is gone, because remember, it's not just a weapon increase. It's also Angoro cards went from 2.0 modifier to 1.5 modifier. And what that opens up is for the old Rogue to come back. And old Rogue was amazing. You want your backstabs, you want your eviscerates, you want your saps. Like these are the cards that are now have a they now have a significantly higher offering rate in the meta. And that's what's making also a huge difference in how good your average rogue deck is. Because those were the cards that was missing in Angoro Rogue. And now Rogue has, in my opinion, the perfect balance between their early and small removals and their large removals. They are in, as far as the removal metagame goes, they are in the perfect spot. As far as the class metagame goes, they're in pretty much the perfect spot. And so all these is going to push Rogue up above the Paladin. And I know Paladin win rates are highest, obviously, because people are more comfortable with Paladin. Um, you may personally have better runs with the Paladin um, if you're either, one, just better with Paladin than Rogue, or two, like, uh, not a, a top player, right? Like, it's easier generally to play Paladin, more to play Paladin than Rogue. So I'm not saying that to everybody Rogue will be better than Paladin, but I'm saying if you're playing both classes at the highest levels, Rogue should be should be edging out Paladin in this meta. So I, I will say, like, because I see uh, potentially a lot of rioting about this. If because a lot of people just see like putting Rogue as number one and putting Paladin as number two, the gaps, the distances between the nine classes are going to be different, right? And for me personally, I think. The difference between Rogue and Paladin is so small. You I, like, I, I could even put them the same, right? Like, I feel comfortable putting Rogue as number one, uh, just based on uh, a lot of the factors that we say. But don't for a second think that it is a significant gap at all. Um, it is quite close in my eyes. Mm, okay. Um, so Shaman Druid Priest. What's wrong with Shaman? We moved it above Druid Priest, and now we're moving it back down. What happened? <sighs> Shaman. I don't know. Look, you're talking to someone who is admittedly or a bad shaman player. I, I I've just never been great at valuing totems, as sort of playing the tricky uh, style that they play. But the problem I have with shaman right now is um, they just don't have. I don't know. It just doesn't seem like they have a set way that they uh, are super successful. Right. You can try to draft towards a control shaman, but that's not a super consistent way to draft, and it it doesn't always play out the way that you want to. You can try to go a little bit more aggressive or mid-range, but once again, I think shamans have a very wide range of um, uh, in terms of draft, right? You don't that have that natural cohesiveness uh, that mage does, or uh, or um, you know, like a rogue does as well. So it just doesn't seem as consistent. And then at the end of the day, you have these totems that you know, are a little bit RNG based and don't really help you out on the board as much as well. So it just feels like when I play Shaman, um, something is missing. Like this missing piece uh, is, is there. And I just, a lot of games that I might get close to winning, I just, I just end up not winning. And it might be because of my own lack of skill. It's very possible. Uh, and I think, You've admitted that you're not like the greatest shaman player as well. I don't know how to play shaman anymore. I used to, and then Angoro happened, and I don't know what Volcano is doing with shaman. Like, yeah. 
the balance, I think the biggest problem with Shaman is balancing your early game, which now exists, right? Like, the thing with the meta change is that there's now more two-drops in the meta than there used to be, and you have the greatest two-drop controller in the game. You're two, right. two, three weapons, which means you're going to always be offered a few of them, and they're always going to be, like, in your, you know, in a number, a large number of your games uh, coming in on curve. And so you want to use that somehow. But that's actually really bad for you if you're planning to use Volcano at some point. Because yeah. you want these things to stick out. You want to play, like, card draw stuff. Because at the end of the day, your 2-3 weapons are still kind of small. And they hurt you. This is not, like, things you want to happen if you're playing for yeah. the Volcano. So you have your best cards in exact opposite directions. And they're, like, very much so in exact opposite directions. Volcano screws yeah. everything on the board over. You can't have anything on the board. It's very, like, stark. And your weapon takes a lot of face damage to do what it does. It, 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 you know, more so than if you just had, like, a good early game minion, for example, right? Like, that would be really good for a, a control style, even. Or a curve style. But the weapon is just not as good for a control style as it is for a more aggressive style. So you can go one way, and then your volcanoes are really just stuck in your head. And if you panic button push it, you're still not finishing the game because your aggro's run out. You need some, like, reach on top of that. Uh, you need to pray they don't heal, and it becomes a much smaller percent chance that you're actually going to pull it off. Or, if you go control, your weapons aren't really very good. And it, the problem with Volcano is that it makes it very, very, very difficult for you to go mid-range. Yeah. Which was the normal solution, right? Like, if you're a mage and you have all these, like, great big spells, and then you have this ability to go fast, you play mid-range and you're fine, right? You decide in the middle of the game whether you're going to go control or aggro based on how well you played in the beginning, how lucky you were to get your curve cards. You can't do that with Shaman. Your volcano is a dead card if you don't go control, or if you yep. if you go mid range, you have to like have suffered a lot of very bad luck and be really off the board for your volcano to be highly useful. So in the end, you just create this weird in the middle kind of uh, kind of deck, right? Where you either have to go aggro and then have a bunch of reach, or you have to go control and you have to draft towards that, and you're missing half of your good cards in either way. Yep. So it's just awkward. That's that's what I think about it. It's obviously it has more powerful cards than like Druid and possibly even the Priest. And it's more flexible than Priest, but it just doesn't come together. It doesn't. Uh, and look, this is whenever I talk about Shaman, I, I always want to point out, I'm like, look, I'm not good with Shaman, guys. So this is not me, you know, comfortably talking about Rogue, comfort, comfortably talking about Paladin or, or Hunter, which I played a ton of, right? Uh, but I think, you know, just based on uh, my results and also just seeing how the class works, I'm just like, this, it just doesn't have that cohesiveness right now. No, it doesn't. Um, and, and like you said, it sort of pulls you in opposite directions. And the draft, you know, you're not drafting towards one thing. Like, if you pick a mage, you're always going down that one path, mm -hmm. right? Except for that, like, 10% of the times in which you go, like, super aggro druid with, or not druid, mage, sorry. Not druid. Uh, aggro mage with uh, mana worms and spells. But yeah, that's the problem with Shaman. When, when it pulls you in different directions, you don't have that consistency and it'll lower your average. Okay, so uh, let's move on to Warlock and Warrior. So during this time, I know Murphs keeps saying, oh, I don't play a lot of these classes. I played a ton of all these classes in the last month and a half. That's why like, I'm very confident in where this tier list is. I have is played right a lot now. of Warrior. Yes, yes, you played a lot of Warrior. Um, uh, but yes, yeah, so I played a lot of Shaman, a lot of Priest, a lot of Warlock, a lot of Warrior, um, uh, and uh, a lot of Rogue, Paladin, and Mage as well. Um, so uh, the issue here uh, with... Uh, we lowered Warlock to be the same as Warrior. So first, uh, we had originally lowered Warlock. It used to be in the glut with Shaman, Druid, Priest, Warlock, right? And Murps always hated it. And I was like, no, Warlock's fine. Um, and then the changes happen. And we're like, all right, Warlock may be better now, right? Because you get to go more with the older cards for Warlock, which were better. Um, especially MSG cards. And then less so with the Ungoro cards, which were not as great. But no, it actually made it worse. And on the other side, Warrior got that weapon bonus. We're like, all right, this is good. They're no longer like by far the worst class. They're back in the meta. And then I actually played a lot of Warrior with like that drafting mentality in mind. And it's been very good. Like, I've been averaging definitely more than 7 wins per run. I think more than 8 wins per run. Like, quite easily with uh, with Warrior. Um, I never felt, like, terribly pressured on it. And so I think I'm ready to at least move it to be tied with Warlock for the worst class. And I understand I'm normally more, like, uh, proficient with Warrior than other classes. Um, 
so but for me personally warrior is probably a better pick for me than shaman or priest um i would put it in the it, like definitely in the middle not even at the uh, at the tail end um and it's just the weapon bonus. That's really all it is. There's nothing else going on. It is just this weapon bonus. And on top of that, I guess there's a little more two drops in the meta now too, which is really good for the warrior because you really need two drops. But again, it's the same for the priest as well. So, and it's the same for the warlock as well. So that's a bonus that all three of these classes enjoyed. Uh, but the fact that you have a weapon allows the warrior flexibility. And what I'm going to talk here, Murps can talk more about why warlock sucks and also has used on the warrior. But I want to bring Cargo bad into this, which is Gorhal. 159, it's a staple, uh, epic warrior card, which means it wasn't seen too much, but now that you doubled its offering rate, it's seen kind of everywhere. And Gorhal is the big picture version, the extreme version of what all large warrior weapons do. And what that is, is it creates a flexible ability to have a lot of reach or to have double the card advantage with the tempo gain associated with it. So... That's your choice that you're always making with the warrior. But the only way you can have that second option is if you are on the board. And the only way you can have that first option is if you've been on the board and you've been hitting his face. So this whole thing only works if you are on the board. So the only way to play warrior is to be on the board. There is no exceptions. You also have a hero power that does nothing. So really, if you're trying to like get any kind of extra value from your hero power the way everybody does in the late game, you won't get any. So you're very much on the board the entire time. And right now, the warrior is just in a better situation to be on the board and has you know more weapons to actually fill out its curve and all of that. Um, so what happens with Gorhal? You get to turn 7 or later, you play Gorhal. That's 7 damage or burst reach. That is more burst reach than any other class has besides Mage with Pyroblast. And it comes out on turn 7, which is way earlier than turn 10. So if mages, you're kind of afraid of bursting reach, warriors you're really afraid of. Why? Because of Gorhal, and on top of that, you also have your uh, your arcane, uh, your arcanite uh, reaper, which is 10 damage to the face over 2 turns, which is still insanely good. So warriors are one of the most threatening classes to the face. I would say tied with hunter. Not even, like, terribly worse compared to Hunter. Because Hunter can, like, chip you down later, but Warrior has much more burst than Hunter does. Uh, the problem is, of course, Warriors don't have the class cards to actually set up that the way that, uh, that Hunter does. But if you can set up your curve and you do curve out well, if you're in the same position by turn 5 as a Hunter on the board, um, you're, you're in a much better spot, I think, than a Hunter to finish the game off. Um, and... When you get into that position, let's say you're not hitting the face. Let's say you're in a more closer game and you're not hitting the face. or you're. And the only reason you would ever be in a more closer game, as the word, is if your opponent has been committing resources onto the board to fight you, right? Because you're trying to be on right, the board. Right. So your opponent doesn't have a lot of resources left. Your opponent has less card advantage than your average opponent. And in that case, you would turn Gorhau or any weapon into card advantage. Because remember, you're still on the board. You still have health. And now you just get two cards for every weapon you have. Two cards, two cards, two cards, and they're killing mid, mid-sized to large minions too. And with Gorhal, you can potentially get four or five cards. That amount of card advantage wins games. Like, when your opponent already has less card advantage than what a normal opponent would have, and then you just all of a sudden gain a few cards while gaining tempo at the same time, you win the game. Because when you have tempo, you gain even more cards because you can dictate the favorable trades. And so I routinely take warriors with no seven drops or like one or two seven drops and win card advantage games. Routinely. Like more than half the games that those decks win are from card advantage. And I always say, like, look at this deck. It only has one or two seven drops, but we're going to win on card advantage. Why? Because we're a warrior. Because all of these cards are actually really large cards, even though they don't cost that much mana. Yeah. That's the I mean, that's part of the benefit of getting weapons as well. Yep. Right. And like you said. Weapons are huge value, especially if you, if you have the life to um, to leverage it with. Yep, add in uh, less taunts because of uh, you know uh, l losing a little bit of the Angoro bonus, and I think Warrior's back. It's it's amazing how easy it is to go from possibly hashtag Arena Warriors matters two to Warrior's probably not even the worst class in the meta right now. Like I'm still not ready to make it to put Warlock at the very bottom, but for me personally, I would definitely take Warrior over Warlock. And it's like we've said before, a class is always going to be the worst. You are never, uh, a class is always going to be the worst. It's the delta. It's it's the distance that really uh, worries us, right? Mm -hmm. When the difference is huge, that's when we 
uh, we think that the meta is unhealthy. But if the warrior is a worse class and it's arguable or the distance is really small, we're fine with that. It's a class has to be at the bottom, right? Uh, but, and it's good to see that right now, you know, Adulta can make an argument that, hey, maybe Warlock is uh, worse than the Warrior. And I think it's quite possible. I really do not like the Warlock these days. Yeah. So what's wrong with the Warlock? Why is the Warrior better than the Warlock? I've gone over Warriors, uh, you know, if you have anything to add, like, put it in. But, um, also talk about why you hate Warlocks and why Warlocks are bad in this meta. I don't think anything has significantly changed, like, you, you know, it's not like the recent changes, I think, uh, have significantly impacted the Warlock. They've always been in a really bad spot. The reason they're bad these days is just they've lost so many of their early game power cards, right? And what does the Warlock want to do? They, because they are completely incapable of rushing you down now, um, I, I don't want to say completely capable but on average they are not playing uh, a zoo sort of style anymore uh they are going to try to play mid uh mid-range or a little bit more control they just don't have the powerful early game to uh, really establish themselves on the board and that's dangerous because they have an increased chance of being very vulnerable uh health-wise and then they can't use a lot of their uh you know their drops essentially and they can't use their hero power so you have a lot of these cards which are pretty good in their own right you know um, feeding time is just a consistent yeah. implosion uh they have for one more mana right right yeah exactly they have a tar lurker right mm -hmm. uh so they which have is the worst of the three tars which is the worst of the three tars exactly uh but once again it is just a one minion that can be removed, that can be dealt with. It's just well statted, right? So you have these cards, but the the Warlock just really needed strong early game. Whenever it's been successful, it, it has not only had good late game cards, it's backed that up with really, really good early game cards. Like everyone remembers the, uh, the Abyssal Enforcer period where Warlocks were at the very top but that was also when they supplemented it with uh, Imp Gang Boss, right? When mm. they supplemented Imp it. Imp Gang Boss, Implosion, Power Overwhelming. Power Overwhelming. They supplemented it with all of those cards. And then Fellfire Potion and Abyssal Enforcer pushed them over the top. Yeah. Because they always had And even more than that, the like, right? they always had, like, that was in the GVG meta still. Like, that was before it became standard. That was when everybody had one and two drops. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, they didn't have Abyssal Enforce in the GVG meta. No, no, what I'm saying, like, the GVG cards were still in the game. So the big curve yeah, that exactly. has changed happened yep. in 7.1 is with Destroyed Warlocks. Because Warlocks right. didn't have its own curve. I mean, it had its own one-drop curve, but it never had its own two-drop curve. So it needed the two-drop curve from neutral cards. And Blizzard took that away in 7.1. Yep. And this is something that we knew about. Once they announced that the game was going standard, and we are just like, oh my gosh, they're losing in Gang Boss, they're... Power Overwhelming is gone because it was moved to you know, the Hall of Fame, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Hall, uh, Power Overwhelming is gone. They're losing so many of their early game uh, plays. And also, a lot of the neutral minions were uh, especially good for them. Zombie Chow, um, Haunted Creeper, right? Stuff that sticks on the board and provides a significant early tempo to protect the Warlock's face. It's really, really good for the Warlock. They're missing all of those now. And right now, it just feels like all the other classes have settled in. They not only have strong late game, they also have good early game as well. We know the good early game that Rogue has. Paladin has lost in the jungle, and they snowball from there. And in the late game, they have Steed, Dino Size, Vine Cleaver, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, you know is some of the most valuable stuff. Mage, just you can't use your hero power that much. They can just you know kill you uh and a lot of the warlocks cards just take a lot of damage by itself as well so you just look at all of the ma oh yeah and also terrible matchup against hunter so you just look at a lot of the matchups and you're just like warlock is in favor against any of them so i have to draft well but you're not gonna draft well because you don't have great cards to draft and that's it you yep. you're st you're stuck with a very weak and confused class 
And the way the, once you brought up matchups, I was like, yeah, and paladins in this meta. Like, imagine how good warriors are if paladins were not dominating this meta. Like, if the top two classes were not like paladin and then like you know like rogue and like mage. If like that shakes up a little, war warriors would be so good because those are yeah. like in order the three classes where it does worst against, and warriors does best against hunter, which is the next up, and it does very well against classes like shaman, like priest, like warlock. Yep. So, anyways, that's a sad state of the Warlock, and um, yeah, it is what it is. If it does end up being, you know, the quote, worst class, that's fine. Warlock has very recently been at the very top of the meta, and yeah, something like this is healthy, right? You want to see the rise and fall of classes, um, and whatever, wherever you think it is on the list, uh, I, I don't think, um, you know, even if you think it's the worst, I don't think it's significantly the worst, so... All right, that's that. That's it from us. This is the Light Forge. We've gone on for long enough. Hope this makes up for last week's introspection with no real arena news. Um, and uh, this is Light Forge 101. This is what, uh, what we want the Light Forge to be about. The next two weeks, we're hoping to get one interview in, like one uh, one guest co-host, and uh, we're hoping to do another one on uh, um, just in terms of the arena, like our our hopes for the arena, not like in the future, but in terms of concrete things that uh, Blizzard could do if Blizzard is listening in terms of, you know, offering rates, in terms of uh, just things you can do with the meta, in terms of maybe cards we're hoping to see in the uh, in the new arena. Um, and then we will have start, <coughs> and then we will start having real news for uh, for the next expansion. And so that's, uh, that's the plan for the rest of the month on the Light Forge. Thank you guys for listening. Once again, the Light Forge is brought to you by our Patreons, patreon.com slash grin and goat. Thank you guys so much um, for supporting us uh, in, uh, in the month of July. All right, until next time, this is Advicta. This is Burps. See you guys. All right. We're still here. Don't go anywhere. We're about to do the uh, the Rogue Arena Coop, as the image says. <laughs>